Greetings from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. On this cold November morning, we are inside the garden room slash studio, where I've taken one corner of my very, very long work table here and turned it into basically a stitchery center. Because over the winter months, I basically slow way down on gardening, as most of us do, put away the hoes and the rakes and the shovels and begin to pick up the needles and the threads and the fabrics. And that's when I will be doing a lot of projects right here inside the house and especially in this room because it has such great light. Now, in addition to the usual stitching, common stitching, such as making curtains, pillowcases, and a couple slip covers for chairs, cushion covers for some old chairs that we found for $5 a piece for the dining room. Aside from doing that, my main goal here is to be stitching clothes for the Hopalong Hollow folk. And I'm going to be using three different sewing machines during this process. The first one I want to show you is my beautiful Red Eye Singer. And this machine is a wonderful, smooth running machine. It is from 1910. They made these I get, uh, from 1910 to about 1920. This one's serial number states that it was made in 1910. And this runs like velvet. It's such a beautiful machine to work on. You may wonder why those beautiful old machines are always so gorgeously decorated and today's machines simply are not. Well, I think the reason is because women had to sew and in order to feel it was a little less of a drudgery to make it more interesting, I think they made the equipment beautiful. Even the little scissors and the sewing boxes. And we're going to talk about some of those items today sewing boxes, lace, and some sewing equipment. Um, so that's what I'm going to concentrate on today, as well as answering some of the questions you submitted to me, which I asked for in my community post. I said, submit any questions you may have about anything, and I will try to do my best to answer those during the video. Don't dress all the Help Along Hollow characters. Some of them are simply wearing a little hat, or maybe just a little vest. And a lot of the work is just done by hand, such as this hat is entirely made by hand. But sometimes I do need to use the machine for little things such as this bodice and this apron. Pretty simple, simple stitching, but much faster if I can do it on my machine. So here is an example of a really simple outfit that I would want to do on the machine. And since each character is a different size, every pattern has to make be made individually. Sometimes I can get a pattern that'll fit a couple different animals, but for the most part, I have to do each one separately. So oftentimes, when I'm making a pattern, for example, I did a series of birds dressed in colonial clothing, such as this cardinal. Now, with the wings, I was able to make a pattern that fit all the wings, because all the birds were rather large. And for the most part, the little bodices fit pretty well, and so did the aprons. So this was a pattern that I could use with several different creatures, and that worked out pretty well. And majorly done on the machine, except for a little bit of handwork with some embroidery stitching. And then, of course, all the hats are handmade. But my bear here, Marley Potts, was of a different size than anybody else and so his vest had to be stitched his pattern i had to make just for him and unless i make another bear exactly this size it would not fit anybody else except perhaps with a little bit of tailoring and adjustments here and there now the hat is entirely done by hand but the vest as i said is made on the machine. Now I don't make all the Hopalong Hollow folk clothes because a lot of them, and I'm going to show you that maybe in a video in a couple of weeks, a lot of them are actually vintage and antique doll clothes that I've been collecting over the past years. So a lot of their clothes are actually vintage, vintage outfits. So this is an entirely different bear. This is Mamsie Bear. She's from my book Mamsie Bear and Mopkin. And all of her clothes that she was wearing in the book, I recreated for this bear that I made out of mohair. 
so everything that she had, I think she had about six different outfits, and all of these had to be made specifically for her. All the pattern, the patterns will only fit her, and each one was stitched on the machine, and with just a little bit of hand stitching as well. So that is basically what I'm using the machines for over the winter months. I use in the making of the Hopalong Hollow outfits. Generally, I love to use either really natural materials such as real felt, but also old vintage and worn cotton fabrics and beautiful little tiny prints, um, Civil War reproduction fabrics, that sort of thing. But I also love to use old linens and old laces. And I am so fortunate in the fact that I have got a wonderful collection here of laces and crochet pieces and much of this is due to one of my customers actually to a customer and a one of you subscribers who actually gave me some beautiful beautiful pieces here to use in my work I have the most wonderful customers and the best subscribers a little bit about the vintage fabrics the vintage laces the bobbin lace I also like to show you a little bit about vintage sewing baskets and stitching items. Today's tea is Harney and Sons Herbal Hot Cinnamon Spice. This is really the herbal equivalent of that wonderful cinnamon spice tea that I often talk about from Harney and Sons. It's one of my favorites, but this is herbal. And the ingredients are rooibos, orange peel, cinnamon, and cloves. Rooibos is also known as red bush, so sometimes this is known as red bush tea. And the red bush is grown in South Africa. It's like a broom-like bush from the Fabasi plant family. And the seeds are very precious because the plant produces so few seeds. This is said to um, help with your digestive, digestive system. And um, I don't know about that, but it's just as good as the other tea that I love so much, that Hardy and Sons Hot Cinnamon Spice. But the good thing about this is you can drink this late at night. It won't keep you up because it's herbal tea. It's just as strong as the other, and it's really good. I do notice, however, it costs a little bit more, and it's probably because that rooibos is probably a pretty expensive herb. But this is nice if you can give this a try. Herbal Hot Cinnamon Spice Tea from Harney and Sons. One of the questions I was asked in the community post was, um, when did I learn to sew or how did I learn to sew? And I actually have been sewing since I was about seven years old. Once upon a time, my mother gave me an old pillowcase and a needle and thread. And with that, just by myself and by watching her stitch, I made myself, well, I guess you could say it was a slip. It was some sort of a slip, and I don't remember how it turned out. <laughs> but I did take it on upon my own initiative to make that. So that was my first experience with sewing. But I also remember that I loved looking through my mother's old featherweight sewing machine box and going through her buttons. And I think a lot of a lot of children, especially little girls, love to look through their mother's sewing things. So, but you know, there was a time in history when. Uh, Sewing was just simply a worldwide necessity because clothing was not manufactured, mass manufactured. You had to make your own. And so young ladies as young as six and seven years old were taught how to stitch. Now, one of the most important things that was in their possession was a little sewing basket or a little sewing box. And I have a collection of sewing baskets here which are a lot later than, say, the 16th century, which is when sewing boxes were actually created for the first time. But these were created, mass-produced, in China in the 1880s and brought to America by the millions. So these were popular in America as sewing baskets. They often had a little ring on them, a tassel, and some coins. And I bet you've seen these in the in the antique shops and wondered what is that well that's what this is this is an actual antique sewing basket 
They were popular up until the 1930s. They're pretty ordinary and plain inside. There's generally nothing in it. They have one, just one, that has some... Wait a minute. Maybe not, maybe not. No. I thought I had one that has some lining in it, and I do. And they came in all sizes, from, from very small sewing baskets like this. To much larger baskets like this. And of course the giveaway is the really tight weave, which is a long-lasting basket, so it's very, very sturdy. And then the tassels, the rings, and the beads, and the little coins. So these generally are easy to find, and they're fairly inexpensive, but who knows how long that will last. So they're easy to find, they're inexpensive, and they're very attractive. Okay, here's the one that's lined, right, with some sort of silk. And this could have been done at a later date, but it is definitely very fragile at this point and sort of disintegrating before my eyes. So these are pretty common sewing baskets due to the fact that there are so many were imported from China between 1880 and 1930. But my favorite sewing baskets are a little bit different than these, and they're from a little bit later date, the early 20th century. By the early 20th century, it was woven baskets that were the most popular of sewing boxes. These baskets are really my favorite sewing boxes of all. For the most part, they were lined, often with beautiful satiny fabric like this, different colors with a thimble holder, scissors holders, and the back was a cushioned area to put your pins. Now often inside when you find them they are a little bit rag ratty and raggedy. Sometimes you find one in really nice condition, but I really love these kind of sewing bas baskets. And they came in many different patterns, like this. Love that one. This one's um, not in great shape with a wooden bottom. Some of them were so small, ever so small. Here's a nice one. I love the colors on the inside of this one. And this one in the interior is actually in pretty good shape. The interior on this box, which I picked up, I think it was last summer, at kind of a junky an antique store, but the interior in this was completely gone. So I just redid it using an old quilt. This one has a really, really nice shape to it. Really nice bones. It's in very good condition. It's only got the top latch, not the bottom latch, but it does have the top latch. And the interior is actually pretty good. And this is the one I keep near the sewing machine full of sewing machine needles and bobbins. Something you'll often find inside your sewing boxes will be buttons, all kinds of buttons, new buttons, old buttons, and just everything. But uh, these are buttons, these are little Civil War bone buttons that I collect, I've collected for years. Sometimes I found them in the bottoms of the sewing baskets and also they've actually been given to me as well as these beautiful little pearl buttons. Another thing you'll often find will be spools of thread. Lots of spools of thread. Sometimes you'll find a sewing box that is just full of nothing but thread. And this is a lovely little um, thread spinner with a really old, old pin cushion and strawberry on top. And I will testify to the fact that the inside of the strawberries, which was filled with emery sand and this was filled with sawdust, really do keep the needles and pins sharp because these needles are really old and yet they have not rusted one little bit. Well, a tiny bit rusted right here, but that was the part that was outside of the pin cushion. So the sharp point that really matters, you can hear it, you can hear that sand in there, really does sharpen these and keep them from rusting. So some of these old sewing things are just so much fun to work with.
many of them many of them had little handles like this it could be carried around and that's a sweet one too nice little compact size great for carrying just the essentials that you need for stitching and I just love these baskets I think they're really interesting they're wonderful collectibles and like I said these are from the early 20th century but they kept making these all the way up to the uh, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, but you can tell the difference between an old one and a new one because the old ones actually were woven of natural materials and you can really see the difference on the inside. If you examine the inside, you can see the age of the early baskets, whereas the newer baskets, sometimes they're actually woven with some kind of vinyl or plastic, not quite the same. Here's another little round size, just a, probably one of the smallest round sewing baskets that I've seen of this sort with rather than the tufted pincushion on the back it's just flat which gives you a little more room on the inside all of these are in fairly good condition I would say for their age and then not when you find an antique sewing box you're going to find wonderful little things inside of it and just a variety of things you may find just a couple things or the box could be chock full of items so I'm going to show you one here which is absolutely full of things I found in sewing boxes not necessarily this one but throughout the years different sewing boxes but first let me show you this sewing box which is really really in great shape I love the fact that it has the different kinds of weaving on it this one's pretty sturdy. It's got a really good size and depth. And all the lining is in really nice shape. Well, Titus is running around the room again with this little bell on. So this one has a thimble. And let me show you the things that I've found throughout the years in different sewing boxes that make it even more fun of a treasure, more of a treasure hunt. So this one, there's a thimble here. We have several little packets of old, old needles. Needles were often a giveaway. From here we have Suburban Oil giving away free sewing needles. Th those are actually kind of fun to collect. If you love sewing paraphernalia, this one also has, hello Titus, this one also has a, an instruction booklet for a treadle singer. It has a variety of threads. A wonderful, funky, funky pincushion. Look at that funky pincushion. This was in one of my sewing boxes. And here we have a little needle and pin holder. This was handmade, obviously, and it's in pretty rough shape. But you can see that it was entirely handmade. Look at the tiny stitches here. And the fabric is so delicate. It's like some sort of printed silk. But it, what's inside of it is what I like a lot. It's got some sort of flannel. But they've stitched little bone buttons inside and some pearl buttons as well. And some super old pins. These are really, really thick pins. And it looks as though a mice, a mouse, got a hold of that. So it's not very pretty to look at, but it is a nice little piece of history, sewing history. Here's another little needle, needle case, which has an inlaid wooden bird, a velvet spine, and places to put your pins and needles, some of your little sewing implements. And here we have more needles inside of this one. A rather um, odd little tape measure from Olsen Rug Company, another sewing giveaway. A beautiful spool of olive green crochet thread on a wooden spool. One of the strawberries emery with emery sand inside for sharpening your needles and this is some really gorgeous but oh so fragile fine fine ribbon it's so fine that i'm really not sure if i oh yeah look at that uh, it's just falling apart this is not <laughs> good for much other than than displaying as an old vintage item don't think i would want to put that on any clothing or hats. But here's another one, and this is some, looks almost like um, some bias tape, but it is pretty old. Look at the graphic on that one. 
and there are 12 yards of this lovely brown ribbon or bias not sure what it is oh and of course a sock darner gotta have a sock darner my mother had one that was a blown glass sock darner and she used it a lot and of course darning needles this little object I'm not quite sure what it is it was in one of the boxes sewing baskets and it's dated um, May patent number 1900 is when it was patented but I'm not sure what it is it has a wooden handle and some sort of grabber or pincher or cutter right here maybe you can tell me what this object is and of course another packet of Piccadilly large sharps and lace and another little thimble but since we've got lace in this let's get on and talk about all that beautiful that beautiful basket of lace that we have here sitting next to us probably spend hours talking about lace lace making all the different kinds of lace but we don't have hours and I honestly do not have enough knowledge about lace to relay to you so I'm just going to tell you a few things that I do know about lace through studying just a little bit the word lace is derived from the Latin word meaning loose an open space outlined with rope or thread which you can clearly see this lovely bit of lace right here it's said that lace was first created around 1493 but we really don't have any definite dates on lace and every country claims to have had the first indications of making lace making so from the Italians to the Spanish to the French to the Belgians to Germany they all claim to have created lace but they probably were created at the same time in each one of those countries well there's one thing we do know for certain is that since its creation lace has been worn by all ages by both sexes by all classes of people from the highest nobility to the working class from peasants to ladies in waiting to babies to Elizabethan men in collars and cuffs has been used on everything from petticoats to curtains to pillowcases to napkins tablecloths cuffs collars hats purses did I say purses <laughs> and lace has been worn like I said by all people I don't think anyone quite wore lace though like Queen Elizabeth the first lace from the 15th century on lace has been a constant adornment on all sorts of items and all kinds of people and is it any wonder we find so much of it in the antique stores because it was used constantly for hundreds of years. I don't think lace is quite as popular now as it has been in the past. There are many different techniques used to make lace and so there are several different names and different kinds of lace. Bobbin lace, crochet lace, chemical lace, cut work lace also known as white work, knitted lace, knotted lace, machine made lace, needle lace which is the finest sort of lace made simply with a needle and thread and scissors and tape lace but we're only going to discuss a few different types today if you just look at the delicacy and fine fine needlework on these laces it's so easy to appreciate it and it's just a marvel to know that there were lace makers especially in the early 20th century that were basically a lot of them were just poor women who were trying to make some money for the family and they would just be paid pennies mere pennies to make yards and yards and yards of lace so we don't really know where many of these laces came from these are all old laces and none of these as far as I'm as far as I know none of these that I'm showing you are machine lace it's made with bobbins and a pillow now this is a miniature set of bobbins these are only two inch bobbins whereas generally bobbins run around four to six inches long they're turned from wood or bone and 
obviously you can see that they hold the lovely little tiny threads. Originally lace was made with linen, silks, gold, and silver threads, but now, and after the late 1500s, it was generally cotton that was used. And you can see these tiny little spools of cotton here. And also, you can just see how delicate those little threads are on these tiny, tiny bobbins. A paper pattern attached to the pillow. The lace maker crisscrosses the bobbins back and forth, following the pattern and making the lace little bit by bit. I have a lot of examples here of the bobbin lace. I think I have probably more bobbin lace than anything else. But if you've ever watched anyone make this, uh, they can, it, they move so fast you can barely you can barely see what they're doing. Get on YouTube and watch some people making bobbin lace. It's really quite fascinating. So a lot of these, I believe, are bobbin lace. Now I could be wrong because I'm not a lace expert, as I said, and it's really quite beautiful and delicate. As is all lace. Another kind of lace would have been crochet lace. Crochet lace would have been done with a little crochet hook. And these are some little pieces of bone. I believe some of these are crochet hooks. This is definitely a crochet hook. But I also think that some of these were tools for making bobbin lace, such as this. But here is a beautiful example of some crochet lace. You can see the tiny little flowers here. And let me show you another one, which is absolutely stunning. Here we have some beautiful crochet lace, but look at It's also combined with probably needle lace. Now, needle lace is really quite fascinating because needle lace was created with nothing more than a needle and thread and thousands of little stitches. To create the lace. And if you can see the delicacy of this, it's almost like a spider web. Can you imagine stitching this lace? I have a really incredible piece right here. It's just truly amazing. The honest fact is that there are a few of these pieces I would never even think of cutting into and using. Um, only those that are particularly made for cutting, such as these long strips. I would definitely use these on hats and outfits for the Hop Along Hollow folk. Here you can see this is crochet thread made simply for lace. And here are a couple more examples of crochet lace. You can clearly see the crochet patterns and the crochet stitches. This one is particularly beautiful. Look at this one. Definitely crochet with little crochet flowers here. That we would consider doilies a form of crochet lace as well. And this one looks like it was done with a very, very fine, fine thread and definitely crochet stitches. The lace that I'm using as a shawl for this little squirrel, I'm not certain about. Isn't that beautiful though? Now I'm not sure if this is bombin lace or crochet lace. Maybe you have a little input on that. Let me show it to you. This really does look to me like bobbin lace. But I'm going to end part one of this video by showing you some knotted lace on some curtains. And then part two will be following, immediately following this video. Part two will follow this one immediately. It just got so long that I had to split it into two parts. Part two of the video will be where I've answered your questions from the community post. See you over there.